Malachi chapter 3. I'm so glad that all of you are here today. Amen. I do feel an anointing of the Lord in this place. And I'm thankful that when His anointing is here, anything is possible. Anything is possible. How many of you believe God came today to this service for you? Just touch yourself and say, for me. God's here for me today. God's here to touch me today. I know He may touch you, but He's here for me today. His Spirit is here to touch me today. His glory is coming to help me today. And I thank God for that. Malachi chapter number 3 and verse number 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? But yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. This third chapter of the book of Malachi is a hallmark passage concerning the subject of giving. And much is preached, and rightfully so, on giving. And yet, I'm not going to preach on giving today. Not that I don't want to preach on giving, or I'm fearful to preach on giving. I'm not afraid a bit to preach on giving, but all of the blessing attached to giving is hinged on one characteristic found in Malachi chapter 3. And I want to point it out to you in verse number 6. Here's what the Lord says. For I am the Lord. I do not change. I am the Lord. I do not change. What are you preaching today, Pastor? I am am the Lord I do not change would you turn to someone and say he's not changing shake somebody's hand and say he's not changing tomorrow find someone else look at him and say he's not going to change next year come on shout it back at me say he's still the same look at pastor and say he's the same as he was yesterday He's the same as he'll be tomorrow. God does not change. I think we ought to thank him for that right now before we go to the word of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Give him praise today. Give him praise today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anoint your word, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name for your glory. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Thank you for following along in the word of the Lord today. Change is a powerful thing. And change is necessary. We must change. Things must change. In fact, when we quit changing, we're dead. Did you know that our bodies are in a constant state of change? Changing metabolic structure, changing nutrients, or lack thereof if you went to the state fair last week. Our bodies are constantly changing. In fact, doctors will tell us when our bodies quit changing, we die. I'm not afraid of change. In fact, I like change. One of the things that I've loved and appreciated about this tremendous church here in Cabot, 
And I think part of it has to do with the fact that this started just 15 years ago as a church plant. But one of the cultures that we try to maintain around here is that if something is tried and it doesn't work, we stop it. Now, I know that sounds kind of silly. Well, what do you mean? You Literally that. We stop it and we try something else. I've always felt like it's better to kill something than to let it die and start stinking. Say, so where are you going, Brother Gaddy? There are churches today, and this is not me casting stones, it's just the honest truth, because I've talked to enough preachers and know enough about churches. There are churches today that have ministries and have things going on that in the DNA of them, they were dead a long time ago. But someone, I guess, felt it wasn't right to change it. It started like that. The Apostle Paul did that, and so we ought not to change. But here's the thing, folks. We have to change. Methods have to change. Culture is changing at a warp speed, so methods must change. And I am not afraid of change. As long as what we change is okay to change. There's some things we're going to try. Why? Because we need to change. Now, I want you just to look at someone right now and say, just relax. Pastors, you're not going to go out on thin ice right now. Some of you are getting a little worried. You got a little uh, eyebrow thing going, and oh my goodness, what is he fixing to tell us? Listen, change is not a bad thing. Change is a necessary thing, but there are some things that should never change. Let me tell you what ought to never change. And I'm not going to preach a long time on this because that's not really the premise of my message, but Jesus said this. He said, Simon Peter, you have well spoken because flesh and blood has not revealed to you that I am the Christ the son of the living God, but thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what rock is he talking about? The revelation of the mighty God in Christ. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do I have any amen corner in the house today? That's why I do not have the latitude to change the Godhead. Why? Because I didn't start the Godhead. That's what the church is built upon. So things are going to change, but not that thing. Amen. So a change is okay. We just got to make sure we're changing the right stuff. And leaving stuff alone that should not change. And Paul said it like this. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. What is the gospel of Christ? According to the Bible, it is the message of repentance. Water baptism in the name of Jesus. The infilling of the Holy Spirit. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, that's the thing that saves you. I don't have any business messing with the thing that saves us. So that's not going to change. The scripture says... Without holiness, we shall not see the Lord. So what are we going to preach and teach at this church? That we ought to be a holy people. That we ought to be a separated people. That we ought to be a righteous people. We give a lot of latitude at where people are in all of that. Why? Because we're all supposed to be growing to be more like the Lord. But we're not going to change that message. But here's the thing, folks. Any other thing, perhaps, that is a method has to be open for change. Amen. Amen. You're living, and I'm living in a world that's constantly changing. One of the things I give God praise for, and I don't know that God had something to do with it or the election's coming up, but gas prices are coming down. Amen. Woo! There is joy at the fuel pump, folks. I don't hardly ever drive my wife's expedition, but I drove it the other day, and she conveniently had it out of gas, and I'm the one that had the gas money. So I pulled in and filled up that baby for less than I've ever filled up that car. And I was just about dancing at the fuel pump. It's constantly changing. It's now under $3. Hallelujah. Amen. Gas prices are changing. Cultural acceptance norms are changing. 
What used to be abhorrent behavior, now in our culture is acceptable behavior. The appetite for violence that used to be shunned 30, 40 years ago, now it seems to be embraced like never before. What is that indicative of? It's indicative of the culture around us that is changing. Governmental mandates are changing. Uh Uh-oh, he's going into politics. No, no, relax. How many of you are old enough, senior enough in your life, to remember cars that seat belts were optional in the cars. How many of you remember that the seat belt in your car was your arm? <laughs> How many of you remember that an airbag never got close to a car? An airbag was a bag you put air in and it didn't have anything to do with the car. But because of governmental mandates that have changed, now it's absolutely necessary that seat belts are in cars, all sorts of airbags, warning labels on hot cups of coffee. What, what's happening in our culture? It's constantly changing. And not only is our culture changing, but it is changing at warp speed. And so what seems to be normal yesterday is not normal Today And what seems to be acceptable 10 years ago is not acceptable. Or what wasn't acceptable 12 years ago is now very acceptable today. And so if we're not careful, we can throw our hands up and get so disillusioned by the change going on. Is there anything to hold on to? Is there any anchor that we can hold on to? This thing is changing and I don't know what's going to come up for a change next. And I don't know how things are going to happen. Let me tell you what we ought to do in a changing world is to open up our Bible to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 that says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. I've come with good news for somebody. We are serving a God that does not change. If he was ever a healer in yesteryear, he's a healer today. If he was ever a lifter of broken hearts, he's a lifter of broken hearts today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at somebody and say that's good news right now. Come on, I I wish somebody would just touch somebody on the shoulder next to you and say, you are serving a God that does not change. Paul said it like this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And in case you came today and said, Pastor, what's it going to get like in the last days? I just read it for you. Okay, if you're wearing rose-colored glasses about our culture, guess what's going to happen? It's not going to get better. Because Paul said evil men will wax worse and worse and deception will be on a high and people will be deceived. Matthew 24 and 12, Jesus says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax worse cold. And so we're going to see it happen. I'm not a negative person by nature. In fact, I'm a fairly positive person by nature. But here's what I know. The longer we go and the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, we're going to turn around and see people that used to serve God and somehow now have waned in their devotion. We're going to see churches that used to be red hot in revival and now it's going to be a shell or a form of what used to be. But in all of that, with all all of the uncertainty with all of the change there is a God that stands in the middle of his church and says when everything's shifting around me I am the same yesterday and today and forever Woo. Come on, I want someone to get it in your spirit today. If there's ever a time to grab a hold of God, it is right now. If there's ever a time to grab a hold of something that is not changing, it is right now. I am the Lord and I do not change. 
Woo! I don't change. It doesn't matter what government says. It doesn't matter what a mayor of a city says. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what theory says. I do not change. It's a big word. You get a lot of points in Scrabble for this word. It's the word immutability. Just wow someone around you and say immutability. Look at someone and say, I didn't know you could talk that big. Immutability. What does the word immutability mean? It means to be unchangeable, to be changeless. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 29, the prophet comes to Saul and Saul says, I've sinned. I sacrificed when I shouldn't have sacrificed. I'm asking you to ask the Lord that he would pull back judgment away from me. But here's what the prophet said. He said, King, the Lord has spoken. And the strength of Israel shall not lie nor relent. If God has spoken judgment, judgment will come. Why? Because this God whom we worship today is bound by his word. God has chosen to use his word to declare promises to people. God has chosen this Bible and the preached and taught Word of God to bring life to somebody. This is why, and I never ever grow tired of this, this is why a message can be preached on a Sunday morning and it affects so many people in different ways all at the same time. Yo, let me just tell you something that's neat. I've had people come up to me before and say, Pastor, I want to tell you, I really appreciated that message. Let me tell you what that message spoke to me. And they start ripping off what it spoke to them, and it had nothing to do with what was in my notes. <laughs> and inside I'm going, really? I, I didn't know that was in that message right there. And the Lord says, no, you didn't know, but it's in my word. One of the prayers we pray all the time around here is, God, talk the language of every person in this house. Let me tell you what's been prayed before any of us walked in this house today is, God, would you speak the language of every person in this house so that there would be a husband that would walk out of the doors when we leave this house saying, I think I can go on just a little bit further. And there's a mama that says, you know what, it might be dark right now, but I've got a word from an unchanging God, and I refuse to cave in and say it's not going to happen in my family. There's a preacher in this house that's going to feel an anointing come up on your life in a way you haven't felt in a long time. That's the power of a word from an unchanging God. Everybody say, he doesn't change. So if God does not change, then we can trust what he says. Because God doesn't play the psych game. He doesn't dangle a carrot in front of us, and when we get close to it, he says, I'm just kidding. If God says it, he means it. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 10. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word. Everyone shout it. Say, so is my word. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God said there's something about my word that's like that rain that falls from heaven. How many of you know when the rain falls, it's for more than just messing up our picnic? There's a purpose in the rain from heaven. Because God said when the rain falls, it's going to give bread to the eater and it's going to give seed to the sower. And then when there's evaporation that takes place, that water goes back up into heaven. It populates those clouds and it returns. We're just drinking the same water that the dinosaurs drank. I don't know how that makes you feel. 
But there is this cycle of rain coming down, bringing forth something and going back up. Rain coming down, bringing forth something and it going back up. Rain coming down, bringing forth something and it going back up. That's why. Let me show you the cycle here on a Sunday morning. Why does God show up in his power? Why does God show up and we feel the woo up and down our spine on Sunday morning? It's because the rain of the Holy Ghost is falling in this house. But let me tell you what God wants. He doesn't want us just to get a goose bump up and down our spine. He wants it to bring forth something. And then when it brings forth something, we send up praise back to him. And that populates the clouds to pour more rain down. And it brings, is anybody hearing what I'm preaching right now? He said, as the rain comes down from heaven and brings forth, so is my word. It is intended to do something. And if God doesn't change, then we can trust what his word says. Because we know it's not going to change tomorrow. Why? Because he's immutable. He is changeless. He does not change change now I know we probably learned this whole water coming down and bringing forth and going back we learned that in school but they probably didn't tell the God part of that they probably didn't emphasize a creator part of that but he was the one that put this awesome design in place nonetheless now, ready everybody turn to someone and say we're fixing to learn some signs right here I want to make sure we get this. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to learn some science right here, and then the, the, the awesome scientist himself is going to walk in here in just a minute and make it plain to us. The rain falls down to the earth through precipitation. It waters and it feeds the earth that we live on. Then through the heat of the sun, I'm making it scientific right now, then through the heat of the sun, it evaporates and rises again. As the air cools, condensation occurs and clouds are formed. This continues until the clouds eventually drop their load of water through precipitation again and the cycle continues. And just as there is a water cycle, there is a cycle for the word of God. I don't have to have 12 people help me preach, but I just need one right now. It comes forth from God for a specific purpose, and it will never fail to achieve what God desires. Isaiah's point in giving this in his prophetic book is this illustration is to show that God's word is just as irresistible and effective as the rain for the soil. That soil needs rain from heaven and we need a word from heaven. We don't need a substitute. We don't need something that looks like rain and acts like rain and smells like. We need a word from heaven heaven we need a word from the Lord I can stand out there all day and try to water that grass with a hose making sure I get every corner but I don't know if you've ever had this happen I've had this happen a time or two when I'm out watering the plants or watering the yard and it starts raining how many of you feel pretty futile holding a hose when the heavens open up. It's almost as though God leans over the banister of heaven and says, I got this one. <laughs> Why? Because pure rain can go where the water in the hose could never get to. Because while pure rain falls down, it's touching that corner of the yard and it's touching this corner of the yard. Substitute water coming out of the hole. I can only point it in one direction at a time. But pure rain that comes from heaven, it's touching every part of that yard at the same time. You want weeds to grow? Let it rain. You want flowers to grow? Let it rain. Why? Because there's something about pure rain from heaven. So as long as I have breath in my body, I'm rising to this pulpit to say to New Life Church, we need a pure word from God. 
I'm not talking that I'm against methods. We need dramas and we need singing and we need, but there's nothing that can substitute for the pure word of God. Why? Because when it is when it is preached and when it is taught, it's touching that side of the church and it's touching this side of the church and it's touching the elders and it's touching the young folks. It's touching everybody. If God ever said it, we can trust it. He does not change. I wish we'd take about a 20 second time out and just thank him that he doesn't change right now. Come on, somebody. I wish you'd stand with me right now and just thank him that he does not change. Come on, Isaiah said it. As the water comes from heaven, so is my word. It's going to bring forth. It's going to bring forth. Everybody say, if God doesn't change, then we can trust what he says. Say it again, if God doesn't change, then we can trust what he says. You may be seated for just another few moments. Now everything I preached has come down to this moment right now. So if you've been zoning out and thinking about the steak on the grill, let it burn, baby, let it burn. Because number one, if God does not change, then we can trust what he says. But watch this. If God does not change, then we can. If God does not change, then we can. Doesn't matter how bad. Doesn't matter how deep. Doesn't matter how complacent. Doesn't matter how apathetic we find ourselves. It doesn't matter how far we find ourselves from the throne of grace. If God does not change, then he is a God of mercy. And if he's a God of mercy, then I can change. And if he's a God that will extend amazing grace when I don't deserve amazing grace, and he was that yesterday, and he is that today, and he shall, if that's the way God is, then I can change out of my mess. I can find relief out of my situation. Look at somebody and say, that's good news right there. There are six cities who, on the surface, do not seem memorable in and of themselves. The city of Golan, Ramoth, Bozor, they were all on the east side of the Jordan River. On the west side of that Jordan River, you had Kedesh. Shechem and Hebron. They seem to be just cities until we recognize that in the Old Testament they were not just cities. They were cities called cities of refuge. And if I was striving against Robert and through my striving I kill him, inadvertently kill him, make a mistake, mess up, now I have the judgment of manslaughter on my head. And I am judged worthy of death. So really there's no hope because if the jury gets to me, if the penalty givers get to me, they can put me to death for taking his life in a moment that I just messed up. I didn't mean to do that. It was just something that happened in the course of life. But now I got this manslaughter judgment upon my head. And so the Lord, within the context of that society, made allowances for asylum in six cities. Golan, Ramoth, Bozor, Kedesh, Shechem, and Hebron. Here's where it gets neat. It was the responsibility of the guilty party. Watch this now. To run to the city of refuge. Because that guilty man or woman was never going to get to that city 
And the leaders of Shechem throw up their hands and say, no, we're not a city of refuge anymore. Why? Because it wasn't Shechem that declared that. It was God that declared that. If you are guilty and you can get to Shechem, and if you get inside those gates, your avengers cannot come after you. Because under your guiltiness, you had a penalty on your head, and you were worthy of death. But in coming to Shechem, in coming to Hebron, in coming to any one of these six cities, now what you are doing is you are appealing to a sovereign government to give you what you do not deserve outside the gates. Get in the city. Run to the city. I'm going to tell you something. I am not the sharpest tack in the toolbox. But if I think for a second that I just might be guilty of manslaughter, I'm lacing up my Nikes and I'm taking off to Hebron. Why? Because just perchance I am guilty. I don't want to be found in that state. I don't want to be judged for when I mess up. I don't want to be a man that, that goes to the grave because of a foolish moment in my life. And so if it means i got to run, i got to run. Why? Because I'm appealing to a sovereign authority to safe harbor me, to put me under the shelter of that city because i got avengers hot on my trail. Why would the Lord say, I want six cities to be cities of refuge when we understand why it was that the Old Testament was written? It was written as a guidebook and an arrow pointing to a new covenant, pointing to a time where in practical nature, physical things would give credence to spiritual things. If there was a city of refuge in the Old Testament to where someone could run and find protection and asylum through a sovereign authority separate from who they are, then it points to us of a mediator. There is one mediator between God and man Man, the man Christ Jesus who stands between us our guiltiness our foolishness our problem our messing up and he stands between us and the judgment that we deserve and says you can come no further because I took wounds in my hands and I took wounds in my feet and I got a crown of thorns on my head and I shed blood so you wouldn't have to have that penalty this is why I rise in urgency on this Sunday morning and say if you or I are thinking about serving God run run to Jesus Don't walk. Don't saunter. Run to Jesus. He's the only one that can give grace. He's the only one that can give mercy. I do not change. I am the Lord. And I do not change. He doesn't change from being a mercy giver just because it's my foolishness. I got a word for somebody today in the Holy Ghost. God does not stop being God because of the mess up that I had two years ago. God does not stop being a grace-filled God because I blew it and ruined my credibility. I'm here to tell you if God has ever been a mercy giver, He is still a mercy giver. If God has ever been an amazing grace God, He is still an amazing grace God. If there has ever been someone that's been picked up out of a sinful state and given a new lease on life, if that's ever happened one time, God is still that today. Run to the city. Run to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. 
I preached to backsliders on this Sunday morning. If there's ever a time to hit an altar and to pray through, it's right now. Run to the city. Run to Jesus. Why? Because in a changing world, he does not change. I think we ought to stand together right now and thank him that he doesn't change. I wish there'd be some voices lifted in this house right now. Woo! Come on. He does not change. He does not change. God, I thank you that you don't change. I thank you that the same God that you were 10 years ago, you still are today, God. You stand here today with mercy and grace and fulfillment and joy, Lord, for our lives. Thank you that you don't change. We can change because he does not. Hebrews says it like this. He is the mediator that shed blood then there's this little phrase, Brother Jay, in Hebrews that always used to puzzle me. He is the mediator who sheds blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. Brother Jerry, I used to read that passage and think, man, where did Abel come into all this? That's an Old Testament character. We're in the new, we're nearly at the finish of the Bible. Why are we importing Abel into the New Testament? Then I got to reading the scriptures. How many know great things can happen if you'll just read the Bible? Cain saw that his brother's sacrifice was accepted and his was not. I don't know if he took a club or his hand or did jujitsu or what, but he killed his brother Abel. And Abel's blood was spilled on the ground. And the Bible says that the blood of Abel cried out against his brother. So much so that the Lord took note of that and came to Cain and said, Cain, the blood of your brother's crying out against you. Guilty, murderer, foolish, stupid act. Guilty, bad. That's what Abel's blood declared. But then we kind of saunter into the New Testament where this man named Jesus is talked about who stretched out his arms on a Roman cross, took a crown of thorns on his head and a spear in his side. And the Bible says in Isaiah that his visage, his appearance was marred so that we would not even know it was him. Blood is cascading down the splintered cross of Calvary falling on the ground and here's what the Hebrew writer said it is the blood of that man named Jesus the mediator the city of refuge the go between before between our mess up and our victory that speaks better things than that of Abel Abel's blood was shouting death Bad, sin, shame, judgment. While Jesus' blood on Calvary. Freedom, victory, joy, no judgment, mercy, grace. I got a question. Which voice do you want? tell you right now I want mercy I'm not afraid to tell you I want grace I want the touch of God's blessing on my life I don't want him not to hold against me what I've done wrong I want the blood of Jesus to cover me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet I want that Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday and today and I want that touch on my life now here right now in this room right now right now 
if you're here and you need mercy, you need grace, and we need something that we don't deserve. Everybody look right here at Pastor. Let's not dare stand here and say, oh, God wouldn't give me that. He doesn't change. Amen. Oh, preacher, come on, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't, but he does. And the mediators, <laughs> the mediator stands here today and says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest for your soul. I'll give you mercy where you don't deserve it. I'll give you amazing grace that goes beyond your failures. If anybody is here and you need that, I'm going to be the first to raise my hand. I wish you'd meet me right here. Would you come out from where you are and meet me at this altar? I need mercy. Come on. Don't be ashamed. Come on, we're here together. I need mercy today. I need mercy. I want God more than I want anything else. I wish we would have folks that would press in as close as you can right now. Once these ones have come, I wish everybody in the house would join us up here for a time of prayer right now. He's a God that doesn't change. He's a God that doesn't change. I am the Lord and I change not.